Well, hello. I'm pretty proud to be here. I'm a little nervous to be here also. I, um, the difficulty of my coming here is I, you could hear Jim was talking about working on a presentation because there's so many issues to address in our complex times. I don't think they're any more complex than other human times, but nonetheless, there's a lot of forces and, and things that are stressing us now, the world at large, and certainly the world of photojournalism. I, I didn't uh, make any preparation. I have a tendency to procrastinate and um, more get terrified about what can I say after following the people that we've already seen today. I jotted down some names. Uh, the first one that I jotted down was I didn't know who Sempressa was. And um, I thought that was unfortunate. And I realized that he was a, uh, I guess you're the Dutch photojournalist who uh, died in the mid 80s, if I'm not correct, in 86. He lived only to the age of 68. Um, the reason I bring up his age is I'm getting there, I'm 66. And I think what you uh, come to terms with is the, uh, the, the increasing. Uh, value and fragility to life. As you get older, they say some people get uh, start to close down, but I think in many cases it's quite the opposite. I think that you do find, though, the things that uh, that you can that you're surprised by what bothers you, as opposed to what you can stand. I think it comes with as you get older, you start to lose some of your friends. Uh, you see, even this world of journalists. I mean, there's increasing the number of fatalities in the world that we live in. So that the, uh, you become very sensitive, in a way, to the world. Like I, it's almost unbearable at times, and it comes in. It comes in. Uh, it comes out in certain things that you see. So, I put his name down. I put Paul Nicklin's name down because uh, I'm uh, Janine. My wife talked about weeping at the picture of the narwhal, and what does that picture mean? It, it, it means again, the uh, the very fragile quality of uh, of, of a beautiful thing in the possibility of disappearing. But then in the same preceding Paul Nicklin came the photographers who uh, talked about Gaza. And it'll always be inexplicable to us journalists and probably to uh, fellow humans is how we keep taking away uh, the freedom and the value and, and, our li and the lives of other people in the way that the, it was illustrated by some of those pictures. No matter what your political point of view, uh, to see the, the kids being carried, burnt, and in this capacity is, is just intolerable and, and very hard to take. Um, those photographs from Gaza are also pointed out that I, you can bitch and moan all you want, and I do a lot of it, by the way, about how difficult it is to get your work out, but then you, 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 you sit here and trying to judge students for this uh, workshop, and then you see the photographers coming out of Africa, the photographers, the Palestinian photographers, the people coming out of Eastern Europe and the absolute lack of opportunities to get their work out and, the, and the, uh, the struggle that they have, let's put it that way, and then makes the struggles that you have, it puts them in perspective at least, you know. Um, and the last person that I draw it down here, I don't know if he's here or not, is Stephen Mays, uh, who was the, I guess, the secretary here at one time. And Stephen wrote a very provocative and very good article uh, that came up during the workshop in a way and uh, about the nature of what we cover as, as photographers. And perhaps in, in many ways we cover too little in the great spectrum of colors that life is. Um, and I'm, I'm guilty of that, you'll see, as much as anybody else. Um, he let, made a list of things that perhaps uh, there's been enough of. And you'll see that I think I've covered all of Stephen's list about negative, you know. <laughs> so, so you'll have to bear with the fact that whatever he has down there on his list, I've covered. Um, and, uh, but I got to say, I got to tell you about Stephen, if he's here, I mean, I adore him, actually. And that's why it'd be lovely to pick on him a little bit. But he's right. Um, when you saw the, the, a number of us said, you know, there's an awful lot to life that we're not seeing, you know. And I, when I, the little bit I teach, I, I have always t try to tell students to look at home or to look around them before they head out. But it's very, but on the other hand, conversely, and that brings us to the issues that we're having today, if you do so, uh, the possibilities of being published are very few. Uh, so the blame is not just on us, but it's in the marketplace, on the editors who just don't want to see necessarily a different vision of the world. Um, but that said, I guess it brings me, uh, it was kind of a lead into the subject of books. And how we got to that uh, word books is simply that I got my, my phone call and we had to come up with something and I just finished a book that's a, been a very problematic book, which I'll explain later, problematic in the sense that 
It hasn't, it hasn't taken that much time to produce it, but it's on the consequences of the Iraq War, and it's not a very popular subject in the States. It's not a subject at all, barely, barely anymore. Much more so in Europe. Uh, it was shown in Europe a little bit, but in the United States, no. So that brought me to the problems of publishing in the States. Um, but I'll begin with, um, if you'll bear with me, being that we got on the subject of books, what I brought with you was a portfolio. And I, I guess the question when you talk about why does, it, the question is why do you do books? Uh, why don't you, and I always consider myself to, to today it is a magazine photojournalist, but I found very quickly that for whatever reasons, a lot of the work that I do has never been quite uh, the right work for magazines. And when, you, when that happens, in order to keep going, as you know what you do when your work is rejected, who's, who's anybody kidding? We get really mad, you know, you get pissed off. And a lot of this anger very often stops you. And in order to keep going, you have to get your work out in some way. And that's actually what brought me to books. So I'll um, bring, uh, start with, uh, and the other thing that is, is ironic and a bit, of, a bit of a contradiction right now is that I always feel a book is supposed to put something to rest. And here I am showing you work that's 40 years old to start with, so you'll have to bear with that. Um, the, um, what brought me to photography was um, I, I grew up in Boston. Uh, I had working, working parents. My dad was a shipyard worker. My mother cleaned houses. Uh, I got to college, the first one in the family. My dad you know, dropped out in eighth grade, which is a tradition of the American Depression. It's not to go through school. Um, and when I was done, one of the things that happened, I, I ended up resisting the uh, Vietnam War, which set a, into line a, a number of things that happened. And that's what you'll see in a lot of our careers. Uh, sort of shit happens, you know. You, uh, you don't plan your life. It kind of goes along, and something happens that next, makes you do the next step. In this case, I, ended up, I went south to uh, the part of the United States, Arkansas and Mississippi, to the Mid-South as a social worker. Um, immediately, I didn't last long, for about a year, I was a VISTA volunteer. Uh, the racial divide in Arkansas at that time was very profound. Uh, segregation was not the law, but it was the rule. It was the activity. Um, after a year of, uh, of living as a VISTA, I was kicked out of the organization, and we stayed and, and started a small newspaper. So these photographs which you're seeing were You'll even see that I was confused as a photographer. I was working with a 4 by 5 camera to begin with, and I met this gentleman himself who was getting ready to go to war. And this is where he came from. And uh, the poverty in, in the Delta at that time was extraordinary. There was real hunger. There was, there was some starvation in the Delta of Arkansas. And these are the general, the, the, the farm workers' housing. And this is a, it becomes kind of an iconic image. It wasn't intended to be. It was just the kids throwing a doll set around and playing with it, back and forth, back and forth. But there you have it. Always in the back of your mind, of course, is that, that terrible divide which affected our lives horribly in, in the Delta. Um, the, the, the best thing that happened to me was meeting these farm workers because they taught me how to be a photographer. I can say that because the rules of behavior were very strict. And they didn't care about photo rest, but they cared a lot about how you behaved. So if you went into somebody's home, the first thing they did is tell you, you know, you can eat dinner with us. And di dinner was very often chitlins and things that I have a very hard time with. And, uh, but that didn't matter. You either eat with us or you don't. Or, and you're certainly not going to use the camera here. They didn't say it. There was too much politeness for that. But that was the beginning. Um, and a couple of other lessons I learned. I learned, as we all know, uh, especially as one gets a little older, you understand when there's tragedy, there's also beauty. And these men were uh, professional grave diggers burying this guy, but as they, were, they carried him out, they were also telling jokes. And I love that fact that, that about the duality of life, and it's what it's about, that, uh, that right next door to each other, there'll be something that's horrific, but there'll always be someone else that seems to be getting by or making something out of it, uh, trying, to, trying to struggle their way out of the, out of the situation. So I uh, left uh, Arkansas. I gave a lecture. Uh, I was asked to do a book just like that. I did my first book at a very young age in 1973 called Few Comforts or Surprises. I never understood why. To explain what happened was there was a bunch of publishers, especially MIT Press that did this, were involved in the war effort. And to cover up their war effort, they published a couple of liberal books, they called it. This one, and Don McCullen did a wonderful book at that time. 
and they remaindered the books within a year. You could buy this book for a dollar or less within a year. I came home I, um, from the Delta in 1973. I had a recovery to do. I had some illnesses that happened. There was some, uh, it got pretty violent at one time. I used to report on the Ku Klux Klan, so I had some head injuries. And I, I came back, and there was no work. I couldn't get a work as a photographer. There was no interest uh, in the subject matters that I was interested in. So for, and I met a wonderful woman in college named Dorothea, and she basically paid the bill. She, uh, she had the job, and I had some part, I worked, at a, I worked actually in a slaughterhouse, and a few jobs like that. And I wandered the streets of my neighborhood. So these are photographs made in the town of Dorchester, Massachusetts, which is my birthplace. And they were just uh, going around and, like you say, seeing what's tough and what's beautiful. And of course, this is beautiful. A little uh, Puerto Rican girl getting married at the age of 16. And I spent time, I hung out, that's what I did, which is what I, basically all I do as a photographer is I go in people's houses and I hang out, as long as they can tolerate me. And, um, and so these are kids having a, uh, you can see the argument, who won the argument. It was the older girl in the middle holding the rooster. And, uh, um, the little girl down here is, looks kind of odd to you, but she's in the process of having one of her many seizures. There was no medicine for the family. But he lost the argument, the boy on the top. And I came back uh, to, it's very hard to, to come back from the South, where I was dealing with overt bigotry, I thought, to, to Boston, where in many ways there was inexcusable racism and classism separations of people. And I, could, I, was quite a, I was quite ashamed of my city. In some ways, I still am. And, uh, but this was taken in South Boston, which was a neighboring community, and they were having busing at that time. You know, there were in, uh, forced integration of busing in South Boston. The reaction was incredible violence. Uh, people throwing bottles at little kids getting on buses and this kind of uh, ugliness. It was everywhere, lining all the streets. You know. And, um, oh, I should back up a second. Um, I didn't know what to do with, because talk we're talking about books, and I had all these photographs. And in this case, I, I, I talked to a bunch of friends, and they all, each lent, lent me $500, and we put together, and I self-published a little book called Dorchester Days. And this was my first trying to get it out, and it had, you know, 1,500 copies. And um, even now I have some. They didn't sell. It was actually get highly criticized by the community, by the local press and um, but it, but I found that I found a way to get things out because I couldn't do it in magazines um, ironically because of this book I was invited to join the agency Magnum um, they didn't realize I never really it was even in New York so they invited me to come to New York and I met the photographers in Central Park and it was quite a lift up at that time mainly not financially or really, but emotionally because someone sort of cared about what you were doing you know mm. and as life gets really good, life turns very difficult. Dorothy had developed breast cancer. And, uh, and that affected us, changed our, both of our lives. Dorothy was a writer, wanted to be a writer. And she quickly realized that the, the, her, the story that she was going to tell, probably the only story she'd be able to tell is of her own cancer. And she didn't want to. She wanted to tell the, about other patients' cancers. But the hospitals in Boston wouldn't allow her. There were great rules about privacy and so forth. So she started telling her own story. So this photograph was demanded. Dorothea wanted me to photograph her cancer treatments, which I hypocritically you know, said, I can't do this. Um, but I did it because this is what she wanted. Uh, this photograph may look a little odd to you. Uh, it is odd because what she was doing is actually laughing at a physician who had asked her to come into the room after her surgery, and they asked her if she felt like any less of a woman because of losing a breast. And she started to laugh at him because, of course, she felt like more of a woman because this is, you know, breast cancer. This is women's breast cancer. And he got all flummoxed and left. Um, I, I always point out that at that time I had a very furious temper. I didn't take his questions very lightly. And um, I went to see him afterwards. But, um, 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 but she had a sense of humor that I was lacking at that time. Let's put it that way. And, um, but Dorothy made a great bald lady. Um, but the disease progressed. She got some of, things, some of the things she wanted to get done, done. And then the disease came back. And, uh, and then I lost her in 83. Um, it took me a long time. I had her diaries and the pictures. And then finally, uh, again, 
uh, I didn't know what to do, and I wanted to do something to honor Dorothea, so the book came out. It's a little book called Exploding Into Life. Um, and the reason the terminology is, I'll explain, is that it's because she wrote it herself, that suddenly when you're faced with mortality, as we know, I mean, we're sitting in, a, in a, the community of Anne Frank, and, uh, and suddenly out of this kind of threat, uh, very often comes a consciousness of being, and uh, it happened with Dorothea as well, for different reasons, and... Uh, so that's why, in a way, she became more alive as the disease began to claim her, you know. Um, I got a, started getting assignments. I got ones that I didn't want. Um, this is the one that I didn't want, which was to go into an emergency room. In Denver, I was sick the hospitals. I never wanted to see another one after losing Dorothea. And uh, I went there, but I also at that time was beginning to cover conflict. I covered the, uh, the, the war in Beirut and other things. And I had seen, as Walter Estrada or other people, I saw death in the street and a lot of it. And um, so I came to this place, and I kept reminding myself that these are physicians and paramedics and nurses, and they're saving lives, and I got to love them. I really did, because they were doing just what other people were killing, and they, these people were saving as bloody and messy as it was in there, they were saving. So I stayed with them and I did a book on them uh, called The Knife and Gun Club. A lot of its language, I kept a tape, a tape recorder running. Um, uh, it was an experience you couldn't do anymore because they, the rules, I've got to tell you, of this hospital was they, they said, if nobody throws you out, you can stay. And then the rules were, show me, the, the director said, show me the book and if it's not right, if it's not true, you change it. And I, but I'll have no say. Actually, he didn't like the book at all because I had some things that were very difficult that he didn't want to see, but he allowed the book to be published. So it's a different time, you know. And uh, so these are a few photographs made during my time in, uh, in this project. Uh, the magazine w wouldn't run it when it was done. It was a week and a half assignment, and then the magazine said no. So I continued on whenever I could financially, working jobs and getting back out to Denver. So you get, the, there was someone used the word obsession. I guess that's what it is. You get obsessed for a period of time with particular subjects or particular people. This uh, ugly picture is, uh, is an echo of some of the things we even saw today. Uh, this woman was a uh, uh, tending bar in Denver, in a Denver bar, and a man, she refused a man drinks who was very drunk, and he pulled, pulled out a pistol and shot her. It's one of the parts of our gun culture that we don't address too much. And I, when, I, when I was there, I was there through the whole surgery. It was, went on for seven hours, and they kept saying they might be able to save her, might be able to save her. And then suddenly she was gone, and they walked out of the room, not just respectfully, because they usually cover the body. This is a, uh, but they were on the way to another crass emergency. So I took this picture because I wanted this just simply to say that, uh, you know, she's not there anymore. She's like the blood on the floor. The, the person that was is not there anymore. And here's a book that uh, began some of the collaborations that I've done with Janine, my wife Janine. Uh, we met about this time. We started to try to do some things together. She's a remarkable researcher and very tolerant of me, I gotta say, and, and the life that we live. But, um, uh, and, uh, and we met a number of people. I, what happened was I got a, a strange commission we wouldn't call it a commission, it turned out. It was from the Consumer Reports books in, uh, uh, in New York. People, same people make the, uh, the reports on, on refrigerators. And they wanted to do a book, but they didn't really want to do a book. They, it was to celebrate their history. But anyway, we went out for a period of six months, and in six months we did, I think, a dozen, 15 essays about what it meant to be poor in America. And some of the people created their own situation, perhaps, I mean, this man grew up in poverty, but he began, he, he became a crackhead. And this is a photograph that I made sitting on his car. He was heavily addicted. So I talked about his life and how the drugs affected him. It was my first foray into the drug world. Uh, a little girl, this, I don't mean this in a prerogative uh, statement in, in, in a negative way. She was a little girl. She was 15. Um, she was, this was her second baby. And uh, she lived in a housing project in Chicago. And the day I arrived, the sink fell out of the wall. And uh, so that's how it happened. Um, 
The downside, I did a set of pictures out there, and they found out about the, being a journalist in there. I remember what happened as I went away. You know, sometimes you think you've really accomplished something, and I went away, and the, the landlord came, and he turned out the electricity in the building as punishment for, their, for them allowing a journalist in, which ruined all the baby food and everything. So um, they, you have to be careful what one does, you know. And I traveled to, uh, up into the mountains of Tennessee, where there's a lot of fun made of the people who live in Appalachia. I had the greatest time. Um, I thought they were beautiful. I think I had a hellacious time getting in. Uh, it took me days of sitting on a porch, uh, being humored. Uh, they made me sit, actually, in the heat for three days before they let me in the door. But I wouldn't go away, because I knew I had a wonderful family, and, uh, and I did. Um, then they became like family. But this is, this is nothing more than my sitting in the car and falling asleep with the boys on one of those hot days. And, uh, and actually, I bring it, the date, the project that we started really was like 1989. To explain how a, a project like this begins, I was in Detroit, the city of Detroit, and there were a lot of little boys growing up, showing up dead in the morgue that they couldn't identify where they came from. It turned out that they were kids that were brought in by drug gangs as couriers and whatever, picked up in, sometimes in communi rural communities. And then because, before they got into the school system or whatever, they started killing them, and they were just there. Um, crack at that time, crack cocaine, was devastating our, our inner cities. I mean, devastating. The violence rate was skyrocketing. The murder rate was like a war zone. And so we started a project, or I did, with a writer named Ed Barnes. I started with Ed for Life magazine and, uh, and went into the very neighborhood. We wanted to get inside of the drug trade rather than from the surface. Uh, this picture, people say, how do you get a picture like this? I didn't uh, create this photograph in any way. I had um, put, I wanted to find out, there were so many guns in North Philadelphia that we couldn't believe where they were coming from. So I asked a young woman to go up and knock on the door of Sam. Sam Ruthless is his name. Ruthless was a um, corner guard for a street gang. He actually carried hand grenades and all kinds of other things. And he came out during a snowstorm. Unfortunately, you can't see the snow coming down. And I, he just came out of the shadows and stood there. Later, I asked him why he wanted me to take his picture, and he said to me, I want you to take the picture because I wanted to put it on my T-shirt. And he says, I'm 21, and I want to die. It's time to die. I can't get out of what I'm doing. And so if I wear this on my T-shirt and, and flaunt it to the policeman, they're going to shoot me. And that's what he wanted. Instead, he got, uh, as far as I know, he went to prison for like seven or eight years later. Um, but that's ruthless. And... Uh, and Carmelo is a, a, a kind of a, a drug addict of uh, many, many years. Her, she met a boyfriend who was a drug addict. He addicted her, and her addiction became much higher. She's tying off her arm. She's been shoot, shooting cocaine. Uh, we get to be very close. It's, uh, I mean, it sounds so sentimental, but uh, she was a great person who was just totally fucked up all the time. And um, she... Uh, Later, in later years, actually, was the only person. I did a book called Cocaine, True Cocaine, Blue. Everybody died in the book. I think two people survived out of, what, 70 people. And um, she survived. And now, we just found out she may be back on drugs again, but it's one of the very few. Yeah. These are young guys who are uh, being carried around in a police car. Um, I got this picture in an odd way. I don't want to anecdote you to death, but I being not so smart sometimes, I got in this cop car, and it was, it was like 115 degrees in the cop car, and I rolled the windows down, not realizing the police had put the heater on, and they were interrogating these guys. Uh, and so I made no friends with the cops, but good friends with these guys, because I met them later on the street, you know? And so things are very strange the way they happen, you know? Um, Donna was a, a young woman, she said she was 24, who later, uh, she was a prostitute um, using her drugs here, and later, to my knowledge, she was killed uh, on, uh, up on the railroad tracks, um, which was not, the, not unusual. Uh, uh, she was trying to get out of prostitution. She was uh, trying to change her life. I, I have a letter. She was, wrote, wrote letters to God all the time saying, release me from this life that I'm leading. But uh, she was released, but not in the way you'd like, you know. And this is a cop named Tommy Clark. Uh, and everybody just thought Tommy was quite a jerk for arresting this uh, guy, because he'll be out before he'll 
Tommy gets home in the evening out for his, uh, his carrying drugs. Um, then they started doing, uh, this is a magazine assignment on river blindness uh, in Africa at that time, in Guinea and Mali and a few other places. Um, and some of the work was collected in collections of books. Uh, the people, other people started wanting collection books. They were more difficult for me. I'd rather have done a more extended look on the community and the community that's surrounding. Because it's just a, the disease is nothing but a, but a manifestation of a, of a life. And I wanted to see what life was like, the good things, the bad things, the tough things. But I didn't have time. These assignments that I get are very short. I never get an assignment that goes over a week, usually. And it drives me crazy. And uh, so the best that I could do was this kind of regal gentleman who... Uh, uh, let me photograph him, but you can see the effects of the disease on him. It's a bite of a black, black fly. The larvae passes through the system. It lands behind the optic nerve, and blindness happens. It's kind of a, blind, a disease of, of, of becoming slightly older or elderly in many cases. I did a, this is a story on homelessness, but this guy isn't traditionally homeless. This is Tom. I met Tom. And Tom is a shark in the, among the homeless. He carries weapons and he robs the homeless. And, this is, and he keeps his weapons and so forth by, on the grill. This is when I first met him. I was standing on a street corner and this guy came up. And it's like, uh, no shit, you know, it's like one of those things. And um, the thing I remember most about it was, and I still always remember the mo what I was thinking. People said, what do you think when you take a picture? And my my uh, film of, of uh, I've pointed out before to people, the film that terrified me as a child, that gave me nightmares for years, was, was a thing called The Creature of the Black Lagoon. It was a, a monster sur beneath the surface of the water. And, of course, the woman with the pretty ankles would approach the edge of the water all the time, and here was the woman coming along the street. So, you know. I did stories uh, 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 for a collection uh, on... For a short period of time, I worked for Life magazine, and I suggested thinking it would be very innocent. I really wanted a job is what I wanted to. And could we do a series on American families, thinking that was about as innocent and innocuous as you can possibly get? Of course, it turned out to be just the opposite. Um, people argued about this man because he had 12 children. Uh, everybody had a problem. The, we did a story on a gay family, uh, and they would, no one would publish that story. Um, But these are, this is a, I think you'll see the picture of, the, of, of gay parenting. Um, and then once in a while we talked about gifts, I guess, that you get as a photographer. And a gift is walking past this family in this hydrant on a really hot day and coming back, uh, saying you don't want to take these pictures and coming back and starting to take them, being welcomed by the family. So this is a very sweet, extraordinary grandma sitting there with, a, with the grandkids. Uh, this is a lot of people's hero. This is Robert Frank, the photographer Robert Frank. Um, I have the enormous misfortune of being asked to photograph Robert Frank. Um, uh, it's something you don't take lightly. Uh, I was terrified about it, and because uh, I know him, and he's he's a no nonsense man. It's the best thing you can describe it. And he wouldn't be photographed. He kept drinking coffee, bringing me to the coffee shop, and let's have Gene, let's drink more coffee. Um, but I did finally speak to him. And then the magazine didn't like what I did totally. They sent me back a second day, which made things far worse. But on the second day, I had this encounter with Robert and his son, who later uh, passed away not long after this picture was taken. And I must say, what it, the only reason I, I treasure this picture is it reminds me of the relationship that I have with my son or that a lot of us have with our children at times when things are difficult and the most you can probably do is, is reach out and touch your loved one a little bit because you can't really pull them inside and that's what Frank was doing here. Yeah. But he was my, there was a few people when I was young that just I couldn't believe. I always said, you know, I'd love to take pictures like Robert Frank, but I realize I'm not going to do that. It's just not going to happen. But uh, you still can, you know, be enamored. And I had stories that developed um, in ways that you were horrifying. It's a little like, I think, when you go to, people, when you go to a war zone and you know what it's going to be like, but you can't believe what it's like when you get there. Um, there was a story that I did in, I think, in 1995. I was brought out to a housing project. It was a famous little story in America of two children killing another child, dropping a, a, a young boy off a roof in a Chicago housing project. 
And I went into the family, and I won't give you the details, not the time for it, but basically I found out that the, the dad in the family was highly abusive. He, I had the camera there. He started abusing his wife. I stopped her. He grabbed her breast, stopped her. He proceeded to beat up the children in the family, and then we had an altercation and left. Um, but these are the photos I made. They're, they're, they're kind of shameful pictures. Um, you can see what he would do, and he would play with them, and that's, if it, you know, we all know, I think we've all heard enough stories about domestic violence to know that a lot of the domestic violence comes out of people who express a lot of love for their mate, and then they torment the mate. Uh, they beat them afterwards, and they come back with love and flowers or whatever it takes, and then they beat them again. Um, and finally, he was choking his grandson, and that was the end of the thing, and uh, it was a complicated short time and I wrote about the experience and, and the big questions of these photographs and why you take them and, uh, and it's still complicated in my head. Yeah. But these pictures were uh, a collection uh, in a collection of, called the, the Fat Baby and, um, and then you meet this, I mean this is the trouble, this, you go from that terrible violence and then you go to this woman who is gorgeous and uh, uh, it was for that family series um, and it was a, a, a young Sicilian woman. We couldn't get into hospitals in New York. Janine kept trying, can't get into hospitals in New York because all kinds of legal things. We called down, it goes to Washington, uh, thinking we probably, you know, instead we get this most beautiful couple. I mean, the man was gorgeous, the woman was gorgeous, and she had this very childish quality, expressed everything in her face. Um, and then I was there, I stayed with him. I, I was there the night that she went into labor. We'd still joke that I brought her into labor, you know, and. Uh, um, and this is at the moment, that precious moment, when you take all of a sudden this living being and you pop him on your belly and, and you can't believe it, right? And, um, yeah. But it's very complicated. It was complicated for her. because She st still thought of herself as a girl, in a sense, and now she was a woman with a lot of responsibility. Yeah. This is Tommy Clark. You saw him earlier in a picture. Uh, the, a magazine, this is, magazine stories don't always turn out the way you want. I think we all know that. I got hired by a magazine to do a thing on a bad cop, meaning a cop that didn't behave the way he should, that used profanity, maybe it was rough to people on the street. And it's, instead, I learned that Tommy was a great cop. But on the surface, he did all the things you could say. He was a bit sexist, he didn't want women on the force, etc. But then he would give his life for anybody without a question. Um, and here, there was a, a black female police officer who was killed. And I woke up at 2 in the morning. This is a very intrusive picture. And uh, I came down, and he was weeping, like, inconsolably, that his fellow officer was killed. All the idea that whether it was a, uh, that there was a female, it was all gone, and he was, couldn't control himself. But he was cleaning all his equipment, uh, trying to get ready for the funeral. Went out with the homicide cops, and just a night of brutality is all you can call it. And... Uh, one night, there were, I went. I visited. It was five five homicides we went to in one night, uh, and then I got. I said, "That's enough," you know. This is the uh, the, the gay parenting story that uh, I did, and um, it was actually quite a, a wonderful interchange. There was a long interviews with both families, very complicated family lives, uh, artificial insemination, and, they, and then the families kind of divided. The thing that I like about this picture, you can see that one, one, one of the men is very maternal and the other one just won't get up. And uh, so, so it brings back a lot of relationships, you know. And uh, uh, he was just sort of fed up for being woken up, you know. The baby needed to be fed. And uh, I did a, a story again, tried to do it for a magazine, didn't really work out for the magazine, but. Um, it was on a street gang in, in Kansas City, a very tough street gang. It accepted me in after a while, um, sold a lot of drugs. Interesting group because it was women who were on street gang, uh, but, the, but a lot of violence, a lot of shootings, and uh, they had a cache of weapons underneath, hidden under a house. Um, and then they would get too high and things would get very ugly. So it was a, they were going to, there was going to be a rape in the room of this young woman. I, and uh, it's one time I was very glad the camera intruded because um, they were very angry and things were getting, kind of to go very bad with bad drugs and everything. And I went to uh, Niger to, uh, to do a story in a little village of Sappho. Um, unfortunately, we went there to do a story on 
the health life and the beauty of this village, and we came at a time when AIDS was just starting to come in. It was devastating, beginning to, no one had any idea that it was AIDS at that time. And this is a young woman, uh, 15, I think she probably is, and her baby is succumbing to the disease now. And, our, and of course, she would have the disease herself. Her husband was a, a handsome young man who was a trucker, and he was traveling on the road, so he probably visited a prostitute and brought the disease back. And it was very hard to, to make the pictures knowing what was coming for this community. And I did a piece for that same book uh, on my dad um, and how he was facing the loss of my mother. And uh, this is a little picture of him. The only thing that he wanted to keep from, of all the things my mother had, was their 50th wedding anniversary address. So he put it in this big chest. Uh, he was devastated. He had, we had to move him out of the house, that age-old thing. He couldn't take care of the house anymore. He needed to go to a smaller place. And it was the beginning of kind of the decline. And uh, bringing you close up to date, I think I, uh, I went on an assignment for the New York Times. Um, one of those assignments you almost don't want to go because you realize it probably won't work out. They asked me to join a human rights group and to see if we can force our way into a psychiatric hospital. That's why I pick on Stephen Mays because that's the top of his list of people who cover psychiatric hospitals, and here I am in a psychiatric hospital. But in the case here, they, uh, they had heard about this place being kind of subhuman, and could you walk in? And the human rights group arranged for the guard to leave the door open, and we walked in, and they didn't know enough to throw us out. They thought we were a professional group. And I wandered through the wards and, and came. This is the men's ward in Ocaranza in Hidalgo, Mexico. Um, urine, urine in the middle of the floor, of course. Um, and patients walking up and down. There were 100 patients in that particular ward, and one, one attendant. Um, and it was 48 degrees of 40 degrees, and there were no real clothes. The showers were ice cold when they went, the food was, you know, we won't go into the details, the smells. It was overwhelming. Uh, people just come in there and they die there without any, basically, no care, no classes, no remedial work. This kid with his, I never could figure that out. Well, he's got a stump of a leg and they tied him to the bars. Maybe they keep him on the bed, whatever. This is the children's ward, walked in. You didn't have time. This is the worst kind of photography because you had no time to know who you were talking to because you had a limited time to work. In Ocaranza, the first time, I had an hour and a half. Here, we had about five minutes. And you had to go in and, and, and go out. And things you can't believe, this young man, uh, we found out later, uh, uh, was autistic, I guess. And um, he had been locked up in the cell, we don't know how many years, four years? Um, they felt he was too violent to let out. The cell was six by nine, had a hole in the floor. This is in Paraguay. Um, and he was just locked up. And when you go near him, he'd reach out and grab you because he was so desperate for attention. And people thought that he was trying to hurt them, but he wasn't at all. Now he's, uh, he's out of there because they, they, they filed, filed a lawsuit, including with some of the pictures. And he now is in a home. His only problem that he has now is he has a tendency to want his people to sit in people's lap. And he's this huge man. And he, but he... Uh, but he does chores, he takes care, you know, work, lives with the family, but he would have spent his whole life locked up in this little cell. You know. So the book I did was, it was about how um, around the world, uh, it's hard to say who the most neglected group of people are, but certainly the, uh, the mentally ill, the mentally disabled are right on the list because if you go to a war zone, you look around. When I went to, first went in Beirut, I was amazed is the mental hospital was shelled in Beirut and, um, and full of bloody patients. And, uh, and no one cares about them, the last people that anybody cares about. We know what happened in New Orleans, right, when it flooded in New Orleans. I mean, they took people out, but they didn't necessarily take out the mentally ill. Um, so it's the, it's the plight of the mentally ill. Um, and this is a project, this is my response, there was a, everybody tried to do a response. If you lived in New York, you had to respond to the events of 9-11. Um, I didn't do very well, I called this Janine's project, um, quite honestly. Uh, I couldn't handle it, I was in Europe and I got home, and what I saw, unfortunately, I'm not a soothsayer, I'm not a very wise person, but I knew that that particular 
tragedy of those thousands of people dying was, was just the beginning of the war on terrorism was something that's gonna last us probably a lifetime. And it wasn't just that event. So I couldn't photograph it because I couldn't comprehend what was about to happen and, uh, and, and the, in the global sphere. And Janine said, come on down. We went down to the subway and, and together we did a book called Stepping Through the Ashes, which is just that. It's, uh, we felt that it wasn't a crime city. It was just that we, we were dealing with a cemetery, uh, kind of a, a cemetery of loss. But it was something that was going to come, and we were going to see more and more of these cemeteries of loss. This is in a jewelry store, just a man coming in to buy a snow globe, grabbing that little snowball with the city. It used to be like that, you know. A fireman searching for, you know, live people in the rubble, which they couldn't find anyone. And a view of the city at that time from the Staten Island Ferry came out. You could, you could, just a sense of the buildings weren't there anymore. You know, it was only an illusion. Some people think that's the buildings coming, the, the little shadow, but they're like, they're, of course, they're gone. And a, a funeral service, but the person who died wasn't in the coffin. This was done to kind of, uh, I guess, calm the children of the family, uh, to make them think there was closure to, to this fireman's death. That's it. For, yes. Um, so I guess that speaks to books in some degree. I think um, books have begun to me, and I'm very grateful for them. I, I never appreciated books until they became, for me, uh, um, a way to continue the thought process, because I couldn't mostly get a lot of this work published, and, and I always feel very defeated. And then you find a way to get it out in a book form. And it's not the ideal form, because anybody who does books knows that you, maybe you get 2,000 books, 3,000 books out. But at least you can put it behind you. Um, the book I'm going to show you now is called The Blue Room. And uh, it became a, Jeannie always corrects my time sense, four or five years ago. But um, it was uh, it, a number of years ago, I, I, I started doing more films. And um, when I was out, out, out in a story one time, I met a lovely farmer named Clarence Kaiser. And I loved him. I mean, he really did. He was this big, burly, loud guy. He was kind of a, he, he outlived basically three wives. They used to have rumors about him that he, that he had two women, you know. It was the way Clarence was so dynamic and attractive. Um, and I met him, and then he passed away on me. I felt resentful that I was, missed him. And we did a little film. Uh, on his beautiful farm and on his passage to the, to the nursing home where he died very, very quickly because he just gave up. He, they took him off his farm. A few years later, I went back, and I'm basically a black and white photographer. I thought I carried some color film, and I started photographing. I walked into Clarence's house, and the doors were open, and I saw it was full of reflections and, and to me, memories of Clarence. And so that's the project that I'm going to show you now that... Uh, that came out, I guess, uh, fall before last, called The Blue Room. And it became, again, one of those things where you get obsessed. I love these houses. I think part of it was because I was also just beginning, about four years ago, the project on the war, which I'll show you afterwards. And here, there were no people. I found myself actually hiding from people. If people came down the road, I would actually hide from them. And it was a great chance to just to be alone and think about different things. So. Uh, and the text you'll hear is, the, is basically my diary notes from the road that's at the back of the book. Okay. Lostwood, North Dakota. The farmhouse must have stood empty for 70, maybe 90 years. You could see its metamorphosis. All the windows were missing. And you could hear it, 
The swallows were swooping and tumbling in from the fields, screeching at me to get out. Water had seeped into the walls. They were green with lichen, swollen, crumbling. Floors were strewn with plaster, branches, leaves, the husks of insects, broken glass, feathers, the shriveled corpses of small animals. On a window sill in the last of the daylight lay wasps, stunned by the sudden cold, struggling to get up, spinning in circles. Ancho, New Mexico. Whoever had lived in the big pink and green stucco house by the railroad tracks appeared to have left suddenly, taking few of any of their belongings. Now it sits vacant. Nothing moves inside but the curtains in the parlor when the wind stirs them. There's an ominous stillness to the place, in a different sense of what memory is. I pick up a doll's head and have this dim recollection of my sister playing with it. I walk into the wallpapered room where there's an old clawfoot tub. I remember bathing my elderly father in it. I look out the floor-to-ceiling windows and see myself as a young child running around in the sunburnt fields. But the memories aren't my memories, and they're not the memories of the people who once lived here. Route 38, two miles west of Hughes, Arkansas. A tenant farmer's shack in tatters. Porch door hanging off. Red ball of a sun slipping down. Red doors in the kitchen. Curtains trimmed in red. Powers Lake, North Dakota. The floors and walls were moist, soft, clingy. Flies were hitting against the windows, wanting to get out. Five rooms, the last one I went into, painted the same blue as the sky outside. Had to have been an elderly person's room. I found it twin-sized bed. The mattress had been yanked off it. Something like fifty half-empty orange plastic vials of pills. Mouse droppings. Strings of Christmas lights. A plastic urinal. Broken pencils. Bottle caps. A keychain. Playing cards. These were so brightly colored that they read like omens. A mass card. I forgot to write down the name. 
lengths of twine, clumps of wool from a sweater, and pictures, black and white ones, color ones, family ones, photo booth ones, scuffed and melted into the rug. in North Dakota, what I think of as the wedding dress house is off a gravel road north of the town. It's a white wood-framed house with a white picket fence that appeared in okay condition, except the door was broken in. There were dozens of cardboard boxes strewn around the first floor, a garter trimmed with beads a tiara, his and her champagne glasses. The full-length wedding gown was hanging, radiant, like a silent bride, from a door in the upstairs hallway, as if someone had meant to come back for it, but didn't. I'm, I just looked at the clock. I'm going on a little while longer than I should have for you, but um, um, the last project I'll show you is the uh, book called War is Personal. Um, I'm going to have Janine read some of the text for me, and it's kind of a nice occasion. It's kind of a, when I was, Mikhail called us, it was, uh, uh, and I'll try to go on for you. It, um, he called in the morning to ask me, to come here was actually when we just received the book out of the box, so it's kind of, and I've got another friend, Aidan Sullivan, there's been just a few people who stood by this book, and Aidan was one of them. Um, and what it is is, uh, is uh, there's people here who've gone to Iraq, um, and there's people who are, who are also troubled by the war who couldn't go, and I was devastated by this illegal war. The way we all did, I tried to get some support to go. I couldn't figure out how to go. I didn't know. The skills of going to a place like they're enormous. The support you need is enormous. So I needed to do something. So uh, in 2006, I said, you know, just be quiet. Get up off your ass and do something you can do. So, um, and this is the project that uh, I started doing. And um, not knowing where it would bring us, I did a story for the New York Times on a returning group of uh, vets from, uh, in Pennsylvania, and I knew I wanted to go in, but what I wanted to do, so what you're seeing here are photographs uh, that are accompanying quite significant text, so they're really textual pieces with photographs. So it's a disservice in a way to present them this way, but then again, I saw all these poor photographers who had to present their material in 10 minutes today. So I'll, I'm going to go along pretty quickly. The, um, the first story, how we got to meet these people, keep asking, and you can ask Janine later, is we uh, uh, tried to go through veterans groups and so forth, and nobody, nobody said that we could do this because they wanted to know what our political stance was, and we tried to say that we don't want to make a political stance. We'll talk to anybody about the con what the, how the war affected them, and that was the rules of the game. The first person that we went to see... Um, ..is Thomas Young. And uh, Thomas was very difficult, I'll tell you briefly. I spent days waiting to see Thomas Young, not understanding one thing, one fundamental fact. 
He was four days in, in Iraq when he was shot in the spine. Uh, he wanted to volunteer. He wanted to do something in retribution for 9-11. He wanted to do something for his country. Um, he was against the war in Iraq, but that's where he received his injuries. I went to his house. I arrived on a day, and what you're going to see, I arrived at he, when he accidentally overdosed on his medicines. So he was in very, very serious shape when I made these pictures and did the talk with him. But this is Thomas, and he was the inspiration for the book, I must say, because after Thomas let me in in this way, and I actually said to him afterwards, so you'll know, you look really awful in these photographs. He says, that's the way I am. And I said, this is my life. This is the way it is. So he's struggling to keep himself up in place. He would get very angry, and he'd slam himself back and forth in his wheelchair because he wanted to be sitting upright, and he couldn't get upright. Um, part of his pain, and I don't know if it's in the text piece, is that he smokes cigarettes because he has a kind of a pleasure for him. He drops on them on himself, but he has no no feeling in his body, so he burns big holes in himself. Uh, and uh, he uses that. He says that someday he'll use, maybe he'll let those sores fester and hide them because this is a way to die. He'll let them get infected, and that'll be he'll pass on someday. Let's see if I can read it for you. Struggling to sit upright, Thomas began slamming his thin, angular body as far forward and backward in his wheelchair as he could. Here I am, wanting a conversation, he said, and it's just not working for me. I'm feeling kind of dizzy and thinking it must be the meds. The night before, he had taken his prescribed dose of Valium to calm the twitching, the spasm of his leg muscles, along with his usual regimen of pain pills, anxiety pills, antispasmodic pills, and laxative, only to awaken earlier than usual. Then he took his morning doses of morphine and Wellbutrin and a half dozen other drugs before falling back asleep. When his wife, Bree, woke to remind him to take his morning pills, he had forgotten it in the haziness and confusion from a fractured sleep that he already had. I should explain that he was, he was uh, uh, in an unarmored truck. He and 25 other soldiers were shot up in an ambush. Um, and he had actually, at one point, because he knew exactly what his life was going to be like, he couldn't feel anything below the waist, and he asked someone to kill him. But he couldn't talk loud. He, he wouldn't come out, kill me, kill me. And it never came out. Uh, but Thomas is still with us, not doing very well, but still with us. And I've asked Janine to, uh, to read part of the text, because this is really her book. I mean, in, all, all, in every aspect, we did this together. We, when I wrote my text, Ginny had edited the text. We work on, you know, I did the design work. She kept me in line all the way. Um, uh, so I wanted to ask her if she'd want to read some of the pieces. When I first approached my son Alex's casket, I thought it might be hard to recognize him because we hadn't been told yet what killed him, that he had a hole in back of his head. But it was him, and seeing him laying flat in the casket, I thought he's not breathing and that he looks a little different, a little older, that his hair is a little bit longer. Wanting to reach him, I was lifted off the stretcher and climb up to kiss him, to touch his head, his hands, his fingers, his shoulders, his legs, to see if they were still there. I lay on top of the casket, on top of my son, apologizing to him because I did nothing for him to avoid this moment. Nothing. To explain what happened, um, Carlos is from his Costa Rican bone, barn, and um, anyway, the Marines came to inform him that his son was dead, and like all of us, he couldn't believe it. Um, he asked the Marines to go away because he couldn't comprehend that this was true, and he went back, and he came back again over a period of time, and he kept saying, go away, because I think in his mind he thought if they went away, then his son is alive, right? Um, and then he finally got a hammer, and he beat on the Marine van on the vehicle, and they still wouldn't go. He broke the windows, 
And then he came back, and in a series of events, he burnt the van, and it caught fire, and he burnt himself. He severely burnt himself up. I think he just wanted to die at that time. So that's what you hear about. He came to the, when he was, went to his son's funeral, he was on a stretcher. And now he's a, he's a very adamant uh, anti-war advocate. And he carries this picture around, the snapshot of his son, and he gets spit on and uh, beaten. And he says it's his son, and people say it doesn't matter whose son it is. You shouldn't carry a, such a disrespectful picture. Mike Harmon is a guy we know pretty well. He was in Brooklyn. Um, uh, joined, he was a street kid, uh, dropped out of school, kind of, again, another divided family guy, knew he was either going to join the military, probably going to die of drugs or commit crimes, trying to clean up his act. He went into the military, he turned out to be so smart, they made him a combat medic. He went uh, through, and he became this medic who saved a, a bunch of lives, amazing number of lives. He also, but the tr trouble is his work turned not towards soldiers, but towards civilians, because civilians were the ones who were increasingly getting shot up in Iraq. And um, this is his uh, identity card. And this is him uh, today. Uh, not today, but when I took these pictures. Um, this was with his grandmother, and at this time, and I'll, the text will probably show you, he was highly suicidal. He was planning when he was going to kill himself because he couldn't get rid of the anxiety attacks and the depression from what he had been through. And also the fact that he uh, ruined his life because he got back to drugs and he got not a, a dishonorable discharge because he was going to get a Bronze Star and all these medals, but they gave him a general discharge to get out of the service. But he came home addicted and um, doing very badly. And I'll explain what happened to Mike afterwards. Medics in Iraq aren't supposed to carry weapons, but I had an M16, a 9 millimeter. They didn't go by the Geneva Conventions anymore. When we went after someone who fired on us, they were dead. Civilians were the casualties. Explosive devices go off, and the gunners on the Humvees would shoot in that direction. 50 caliber bullets go right through cars, doors, engines. We would attend to mostly women and children, and half of them died on me. You get to the car, and there's this guy with no head, and blood was shooting from his neck. Some guys laughed. I mean, these were good guys who saw this too much. My nightmares are pretty much the same now. I'll have a panic attack, palms sweaty, lightheaded. You feel like you're having a heart attack. Last time was 1.30 in the morning. I heard my grandmother saw her but couldn't respond. The words, I'm okay, I couldn't get them out. Mike went past the, the day that he was going to kill himself with help from his friends, and now he's... Uh, He's a college student and uh, planning to go to law school, and so far everything's holding. The, the, the depression is still there, but so far it's under control. Mona Parsons, the pictures here you're seeing, and I'm going to pick up the pace of, of, of the last, um, the night before his son went back to Iraq. He had come home on leave and was heading back the next morning, and they tried to persuade him not to go back. The whole family wanted to hit him on the head and bring him to Canada. The things were preposterous, and this is what they wanted to do. But he got, he got uniformed up, and this is, he said goodbye to his children. It was time for Mona to drive her son to the airport. Jeremy pushed his duffel bag close to the front door, then hurried into his children's room. Bending over the crib, he kissed his two-year-old son, Al, as he slept, before stooping down to hug Pearl. He found his wife slumped over on a couch, took her face between his hands, and tried to console her. As the day for him to return to Iraq had grown closer, Marikar had become more and more afraid, had anxiety attacks, difficulty sleeping, recurring nightmares. She would hear gunshots, see cars exploding, watch as men with guns and knives placed a long black hood over his head. Jeremy told Marikar that he wouldn't be gone long, that he loved her. She grew rigid. If you love me, she said, you won't go. This is uh, the mom saying goodbye at the airport. Princess Samuels, uh, you'll see... 
in the set of the pictures was a beautiful young woman. Um, and the pictures are pretty self-explanatory. I'd read the U.S. Department of Defense press release stating that, the prin that Princess Samuel died in Taji, Iraq as the result of indirect fire. I'd read the obituary, but nothing prepares you. She lay outstretched with her head upon a pillow. Her hair was cut short, was ink black, skin walnut brown, smoky, ashen. You could see that she'd been beautiful, but now she looked older than she had in photographs, much older than her 22 years. Despite the august uniform or because of it, she looked slight, angular, frail. Her eyes were closed, but there was no illusion that she was asleep. The mourners moved down the aisle towards the coffin. A few people paused to touch the princess's hand and say a prayer. An elderly woman, close to tears, walked away, shaking his head. What a waste, he said. A woman bent forward to kiss princess goodbye. Kimberly is, uh, the piece will probably tell you, I'm not sure, she defected. She had gone to Iraq for tour, uh, had some very near-death experiences, worried about her family. She had a couple of kids at home and a husband. She did it for the money to support the family. She also was very, had some very severe sexual harassment uh, while she was there from other soldiers, from male soldiers, and so she defected with her husband and they went to Canada, and it's been a very tough time for them. They're still worried about being deported back to the States. This is her living with her family. She's from Texas, uh, originally. On the way to Canada, I threw my military dog tags away. Here you go. I took your space. <laughs> Good. you got to hit me out of the way. <laughs> On the way to Canada, I threw my military dog tags away. It felt like a weight coming off of my heart. It was late afternoon by the time we reached the border. The kids were asleep. We crossed the Rainbow Bridge in Niagara Falls, just showed a driver's license. It was still winter, a rainy day, until it suddenly turned sunny on the other side and there was a rainbow. Now we've been in Toronto a year and a half, so we live day by day, not in the future, because it's too hard to. The government knows where I'm at. They can come and get me whenever they want and stick us in prison. With the laws changing in Canada, they're different than they were during Nam. They could come and get me. So they're pretty conflicted. Her husband in particular is very homesick and wants to come home, but uh, they can't come home. Dusty is a, as you'll see, is a, a, a young soldier who was in, was in a, another vehicle. Was hit by a, an IED explosion, thrown out of the uh, out of the vehicle, the Humvee, and then into a pool of gasoline, where he caught fire and burned his hands off and and in his face. And now he's uh, he has a new baby, and that's what the ser the thing's about here. Is about Dusty. Now Dusty's a military recruiter. He's very much in favor of the war. Very, very. Uh, as he calls it, patriotic. I was the one who said I never want to have kids. You know, since leaving for Iraq, my life has changed so much. It's, I don't know what did it, but coming home put my life into perspective. It's sad to see guys who went over fought for their country and couldn't leave the war there. I don't have time for that. Now because of the injury, I don't have to get up in the morning, don't have to leave home, don't have to work every day. So for me, that's a great benefit. How many people can have a five-month-old daughter and stay home and play with her nonstop? And Nelida uh, is, uh, as you'll see, is a, and it's Janine's turn. I'll get her up there this time. But um, Nelida is, uh, we know, we met a whole lot of mothers 
and a whole lot of parents went out had to take care of their kids, like it's all over again. And uh, Neller is the kind of classic example of the mother who just gives up her whole life for her child. And um, Jose, the son, I, it may be here in the piece, so it may be intruding on my own little piece of text, but he was a, a, a sheriff in a small New Hampshire town being prepared to go to law school. And he joined the National Guard, and another roadside bomb took 40% of his brain. And, uh, and these are the pictures you'll see. And they were always hoping, they were always talking to him. They think deep down inside that someday that he'll come back and someday uh, he'll talk. Um, but uh, there's no evidence that it'll ever happen. Of course. Jose was the youngest police chief in the state of New Hampshire. He was studying to be a lawyer, but then he was in the National Guard and they asked for volunteers. They were guarding an Iraqi police station when the bomber's car hit. When they found Jose, the lower part of his body was still inside the Humvee, but the explosion had gone under his helmet, and the left part of his brain was out in the sand. There was a phone call. We need to notify you that your son had an accident and is in surgery. But they couldn't give me any news how bad he was. I kept calling. As soon as we know, ma'am, Finally, when he got to Germany, they told me it was an injury on the head. How bad is it? I'm still evaluating your son. I'll call you when I'm done. I said, I'm his mom, for God's sake. This is Nella to doing what she does every day, is coming into the room early in the morning and trying to get him up. And uh, she's a little tiny woman, drags him to his up, cleans him, bathes him, and gets him ready for what therapy he is. Now she's living in Florida with him, but takes care of him every day. And this is going to be, this is Nellity's life, as long as Jose lives. This is Jose's daughter, uh, who comes and treats him, just talks to him, pulls, pulls his cheeks, pulls his ears, uh, treats him like you treat your dad. And the last story that I'll show you is uh, Paula. Um, and this is uh, Paula, as life is focused around now, visits to Arlington National Cemetery. So this is uh, one of my visits to Arlington National Cemetery. And the little boy here, his father's buried in one of the uh, gravestones to the right. And they were climbing trees and playing with the dog. It's part of their existence now. The cemetery is not a sacred place. It's a home place. And this is uh, one woman talking about her son. When we first buried Bob, I would look around the cemetery and count the stones in his row. Then it got to the point where there was another row, and there was another row, and another row. So now when I got down there, I don't count the stones in his row. I count the new ones in front of him. But what's most troubling is the empty initial C in the eyes of the people who come to the cemetery, especially the military guys who walk up and down the rows looking for a name. They're always, they're almost like in a daze. You go up to them and ask them if they're all right, and they'll say, yeah, I'm all right. I'm just looking for someone, that's all. This is a guy, actually, he's a brain-damaged soldier who visits the looking for his friends. And this is a little girl who, I, who doesn't talk since she lost her father. She, didn't, she just stopped talking. She stopped talking to friends and family. And she's slowly coming back, but she just stopped talking. And so she came to the cemetery one day. And that's where it's personal.